it's one of the oldest and largest churches in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And it doesn't take very long to feel the history of this church once you walk inside the front doors. The parish itself was established in 1859 by Father Joseph DeVries, but even before the parish was formally established, Father DeVries had been in the area for about five years beforehand, uh, traveling by horseback, going to various surrounding counties in order to minister to the needs of the people and to celebrate masses and so forth. Because of the growth of the Louisville-Nashville Railroad, there was the request that a parish be established here in Bowling Green by the families of the railroad workers. Okay. And so uh, at that time, we were part of the Diocese of Louisville. And so the bishop gave the instruction to Father DeVries to establish a parish in Bowling Green. And so the parish was formally established in mid-1859. Uh, a wooden church was built very quickly at the corner of Church Avenue and Berry Street. Uh, on the weekends, it uh, functioned as the sanctuary for masses and everything. During the week, it operated as a school. Uh, about a month after that building was built, then construction began on the brick church uh, that we are presently standing in. Um, this has been a project for more than 30 years because Father DeVries uh, had a particular vision for the church. He was originally from the Netherlands. Uh, he came, he immigrated to the United States before he was ever a priest, but was eventually ordained as a priest for the Diocese of, of Louisville. And with that instruction to establish a parish and build a church, he, being from Europe, had these great images of European churches in mind, and he wanted people when they came into this church to have the experience that they were stepping into the Cathedral of Cologne, Germany. Exteriorly, the church looks nothing like the cathedral in Cologne, but if you are to stand at the main doors of the church of Cologne, and then you look towards the sanctuary, and you stand at the front doors of the Church of St. Joseph and look towards the sanctuary. The views are very similar with the, uh, the pillars and the arches and everything that draw your attention to the, the high altar and to the sanctuary. So this is, uh, this is a fine example of Gothic architecture. I would say that in the, uh, in the region around here, it's the best example of, Garth, of Gothic architecture that we have. You said it took 30 years. Why did it take so long? Well, part of it was because the growing population in Bowling Green of Catholics, and as the population grew, uh, the church needed to, to grow as well too in order to accommodate those who were coming uh, to masses and so forth. So uh, the church was, was expanding, and um, also we had you know, different events that were taking place within our own nation. We had the outbreak of the Civil War just a few years after the parish was established. Mm -hmm. And so with the outbreak of the Civil War, there was a limited work that was done on the brick church itself. So, but following the, the, uh, the conclusion of the Civil War, construction resumed again and expansion continued to grow. And, um, and also the various aspects, the features of the church uh, Father DeVries was very specific on what he wanted included. The stations of the cross in the church, all of the, sta the statuary that's in the church uh, comes from Europe. And he was making uh, arrangements to make sure that those were very carefully selected and very carefully shipped uh, to the United States and eventually make their way uh, to Bowling Green. Would have arrived just a few blocks down the way here on the, uh, the Barren River. Uh, by, by uh, boat and then brought by carriage and wagon up, uh, up Church Avenue uh, to be put into the church. When you look around this building today, it's just quite remarkable. Talk about some of the more uh, distinct features uh, that, that you see when you come in here. Okay, well I think first off, um, because of the architecture and the way that Father DeVries wanted your focus to be brought directly to the sanctuary is the high altar. Uh, 
which features the, uh, the crucifixion scene with Jesus on the crucifix and with uh, his mother Mary and with the beloved apostle that are on either side of the sanctuary. And of course, then right underneath that, built into the high altar is the tabernacle. And so that's the, what, your, what your focus is brought to immediately. And then on either side of the high altar, you have the side altars, uh, one the altar of Mary and the other the altar of Saint Joseph. Then as you begin to move through the church, uh, you're certainly taken in by the Stations of the Cross and uh, then the other statuary work that is in here of Saint Anne and, the, uh, and the, her daughter, you know, Mary. Then we have Saint Anthony holding the infant to Jesus and then Saint Therese uh, altar, which is near the baptismal font. Talk about the stained glass windows as well. I mean, you look around and you see them and they're just really stunning, aren't they? They really are. Um, one of the, the images for St. Joseph is the fleur de lis or the flower of the lily. And that is the main feature through all of the windows in here is the repeated fleur de lis design in everything. Um, we jokingly say that with uh, school kids when we're there in here, that they're counting how many fleur de lis are actually in the windows and in other features uh, of the church itself. Are the pews, are the original pews, would you think? The, we do have some of the original pews that are in here, but the, the pews that are here now are a second set of pews that were, were brought in uh, with some of the work that has happened continuously uh, over the, uh, the life of the church since 1859. So, but some of the original pews are still here. Uh, you can notice them on either side of the sanctuary, uh, usually where people that are serving at mass are uh, seated uh, during the celebration of mass. You mentioned Father DeVries so much. Was he able to live long enough to see the fruition, I guess, of his, of his plan? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, he was. This really became his life work. Um, it, there's an interesting story about Father DeVries because for a brief time he was assigned to another parish in Louisville and a friend of his who was also from the Netherlands who was a priest was assigned at St. Joseph and neither one of them thought that that was a good decision and so as soon as Father DeVries got to Louisville he booked passage to Rome in order to meet with a congregation of bishops at the Vatican to challenge the decision. And uh, when he came back from his visit to the, the Vatican, the decision was reversed and Father de Vries returned to St. Joseph and Father Box returned to St. John's in Louisville. So it really did become the life work of Father de Vries. And uh, we say that the, that the church that he built and invested so much time and energy and talent into also became his tomb uh, because he is interred under the sanctuary uh, of, the, uh, of the church and his headstone is located just to the left of the, uh, of the high altar. The church, the altar, the high altar was solemnly consecrated at Easter in 1889 and Father de Vries died uh, on August the 10th, the same year. So just shortly after the consecration of the high altar, uh, he died. So, uh, and he had left the instruction that if possible that his body would be interred under the sanctuary of the church. And so we worked to honor that. Was that fairly common back in the 1800s? That would have been somewhat common because we do have a couple other parish churches within the Diocese of Owensboro today where the uh, founding pastors have had the same request to be interred under the sanctuary. So. But it's part of the tradition of the Catholic Church as well, too, to have altars built over top of the uh, places of rest, the graves of those that have been seen to uh, lead very saintly and holy and inspiring lives for us. You said you've been here for six years, the pastor at this church for six years. Uh, mm -hmm. When you walk in this sanctuary, how much history do you feel just as soon as you walk in the doors? Oh, I feel like I'm just I'm entering into this whole sphere of, of history. Uh, and I love that aspect. Um, Father DeVries was the first pastor here, and I'm very much aware that I follow in his footsteps, I follow in that tradition. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was the first and I'm the 14th. So I feel like I'm just immersed in, in the history of things here. So, and it's interesting too that there are families that have been part of the parish here for a very, very long time. And they can 
Uh, some members of those families, they don't remember Father DeVries, but they remember the second pastor that was here. Uh, Father DeVries was here for 34 years, and the second pastor, uh, Monsignor Thomas Hayes, was here for 54 years. So for the first 88 years of the parish, they only knew two priests, they only knew two pastors. And so we do have um, living members of the parish that remember uh, Monsignor Hayes and, and his involvement with the people and, and his celebration of sacraments and everything here. As far as just today is concerned, do you guys as a church have like, you know, any kind of goals as far as the future is concerned? Well, certainly. Uh, there's a lot of different things. Um, one of the things that we have going on right now is a basilica task force where we have a group of people that are working on a petition that will eventually be submitted to the Vatican uh, to petition asking that St. Joseph be recognized as a minor basilica, uh, recognizing the, the work and the ministry and the contribution to uh, Catholics within the community, but also to the larger community uh, as a whole. Um, because people here in Bowling Green, even if you're not Catholic, most people are very familiar with St. Joseph Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So, and part of that comes to our ministry with the school as well too. Mm -hmm. um, the parish was the first to offer any kind of organized formal education here in Bowling Green. Uh, that did start with uh, the wooden frame church that was initially built back in uh, the summer of 1859. And then eventually, we, in 1862, there were four Sisters of Charity of Nazareth that uh, came to Bowling Green by train and, uh, and established St. Columba Academy. Uh, but in the early 1900s, the city wanted to purchase the property downtown where St. Columba Academy was located in order to build uh, Bowling Green High School and the Junior High School. And at that point, Monsignor Hayes said, then we will move uh, the school to the campus of St. Joseph Church. And so in 1910, they began to build uh, the first school building on the campus here. And in the fall of 1911, we had our first classes in that building and it's still used today. So, um, so that's one of the other goals of the uh, church as well too, is to continue, continue to grow the school and, uh, and help those uh, youngsters continue to make an impact and a contribution to the larger community uh, of Bowling Green and Warren County or wherever the Lord may eventually take them that because of their education here, they are wanting to be generous and give back to the communities and where they live. If you would like to visit St. Joseph, church leaders say they do offer tours. The address is 434 Church Avenue in Bowling Green. Reporting from Bowling Green, Kentucky, Barry Hyatt, NCTV.